Okay, um, I just should start by thanking Richmond University and the International Visual Arts and Cultures Research Centre at Richmond for supporting my trip to Cardiff. I'd like to begin my talk with three slides. The first is the shaft scene in Lascaux, which is arguably the Paleolithic shaman image that we see in a great number of textbooks. The second is Vitzen's Tungus Shaman or Priest of the Devil from 1692, which is the first pseudo-ethnographic example of a Tungus Shaman, except of course with, with the clawed feet as Ronald Hutton points out, Vitzen's shaman is as, more, as much devil as ethnographic fact. And the third is of two more recent shamanic figures. Uh, Joseph Boyce, uh, in the performance Coyote, I Like America and America Likes Me, where Boyce was uh, brought in to an apartment block in New York and sat with a, a live coyote with his alchemical felt walking stick and fat um, and was said by many in attendance to have entered an altered state of consciousness and Boyce did term himself a shaman. And then 30 years later in 2004, the artist Marcus Coates performed a Hana style shamanic journey for the residents in a, an apartment block in Liverpool who were about to be evicted as their apartment block would be knocked down. So I'm interested in how these different shamans across time have come to be defined as such, how artists and shamans seem to be interchangeable. And this is something which has been troubling me for some time, and I want to go through how this construct of art and shamanism has come about, present some critical remarks on it, not throw the baby out with the bathwater, but drawing on more recent thinking in animism to consider how we might go back to the Lascaux shaman and think differently about that particular figure. Because the problem is that the way in which art and shamanism seems to have become interchangeable that almost any artist can be called a shaman. Boyce, Coates were clearly performing as shamans, that's pretty straightforward and we can make critical remarks on that, but can we really see Van Gogh, Damien Hirst as shamans? Are these useful, is this a useful way to think about art and shamanism? I think we can trace this back to the emergence of the terms in the late Renaissance, early modern period. Vasari, the father of art history, in his Lives of the Artists, defines, uh, separates art from craft for the first time. So art emerges as a, as a discrete term. And Vasari saw the artist, Michelangelo in particular, as divinely inspired. Then in the 18th century, Kant, among, among other philosophers, started to <coughs> make a distinction between aesthetics, history and context, and saw the artist again as inspired by God. Hegel, in the late 18th century, early 19th century, attempted to suggested that the artist attempted to represent and articulate the divine idea in material form. So this is the emergence of the modern term art with a capital A and the artist as an individual who is divinely inspired. Interestingly, the term shaman emerges around the time of Vasari, within Vasari's lifetime. Um, the keep up in my notes. Okay, so art, shamanism, become crystallised in this early modern period. Um, following Witzen, German explorers in particular were going into the region of the Tungus and other shamanic communities, and the German term shamanen becomes shaman in English. 
Diddles, I keep pressing the wrong buttons. Diddles in Encyclopedia defines shamans for the first time. Um, and this is a part of that early modern gaining, using terminology <laughs> to gain control over the other. So this is a, a crucial period. And Diddle himself brought shamanism into uh, European thinking through his novel Le Niveau de Rameau, Rameau's nephew, in which he distinguished between moi, who is the rational enlightened European, and his opposite Louis, who is an inspired shaman-like figure who is irrational. Herder then went on, went on to suggest that Orpheus was the noblest of shamans, again drawing on this term and applying it to classical material. So there's this unfolding crystallization of the term shaman into what we recognize as shamanism today. And this continues in the 18th century as art and shamanism become increasingly entangled. Then a key, key moment, I think, in this relationship between art and shamanism comes with the authentication of cave art in the late 19th century. And the classic article here is Reinach's Art and Magic, in which he associates shamanism with cave art, and in particular the expression of what he saw as the most primitive of religion. And in relation to hunting magic. Hello, Henry. I have um, moved into your post and you'll follow me if that's all right. This Paleolithic shaman then becomes iterated by the Abbe Henri Bray in his Sorcerer from Le Trois Frères. Um, I'm not saying there is a direct comparison with Vitson's shaman, but we do know that Bray was elaborating on some of those features within the cave that uh, have been lost to us now. <coughs> the history of art certainly draws upon this Paleolithic shamanic figure in the work of Gombrich. It's that classic bestseller, The Story of Art, which all art history students see in their first year. In the very beginning, a small chapter, Strange Beginnings, associates Paleolithic cave art with, with hunting magic and with shamanism as the earliest form of religion. Then uh, further into the 1950s, Lommel talks about shamanism as the beginnings of art. Uh, Kirchner points to the so-called stricken shaman, as he puts it, in the shaft scene um, as a classic shamanic figure. And then we move on to, of course, Eliade, who references Kirchner and his celebrated relief at Lascaux, of the Lascaux Shaman. Shamanism takes on a slightly different form and is brought into the 1980s with the work of Lewis Williams and Dowson, which Fionn was talking about earlier on. So I'm not going to go into detail about the neuropsychological model because I want to move on to other things, but they propose um, a neuropsychological origin for certain motifs seen in Paleolithic cave art, drawing on uh, their earlier work in South Africa. And yet again, we see these various sorcerers from Le Trois and Lascaux reproduced in that model and understood not so much as actual shaman figures, but sh the, the somatic hallucinatory experiences of shamans. So shamans representing themselves and their hallucinatory experiences on cave walls. This is an idea which the, the entoptic phenomena idea is borrowed and becomes incorporated into um, megalithic art, first with Richard Bradley, um, then Lewis Williams and Dowson again, <coughs> Jeremy Dronfield, as we all mentioned. And the problem that started to emerge then was that People in rock art research were picking up on entoptic motifs and finding them in almost any artistic tradition in what came to be termed a shamania. Um, my concern is less to do with that because it is possible to, within that, identify differences in traditions to, to 
celebrate diversity rather than focus on similarity. But my concern was, was with Lewis Williams' increasingly rational materialist position on this. With, there, was a de, there was a developing sort of neuro-theological approach which saw shamanism and God within the brain so that shamans' experiences become limited to brain events. And I think that comes out in, in the quotes here. So I became interested in this theorising of animism in the early 2000s. Uh, of course, animism originally for Tyler and Fraser was something that was incorrect. Primitive people did not understand science and their identification of spirits and other an anim animacy <coughs> in objects was mistaken. But such scholars as Graham Harvey, Eduardo Veros de Castro and others have revisited animism, particularly ba based on the perspectival understanding in Amazonia, which in simple terms recognises a world which is filled with people, only some of whom are human. So there are human people, there are tree people, there are jaguar people. And it is therefore important in daily human life to maintain what Julie Cruikshank calls maintain proper social comportment when engaging with these other persons. But of course, frequently humans fail to do this, which creates imbalance, and these relationships have to be repaired. And it's the role of shamans to do this. And I think that this brings a new way, a different way, <coughs> of thinking about shamanism and what shamans do, which takes us out of this rational materialist trench and is a bit more sensitive. So rather than talking about altered states of consciousness and this being about brain events, we might consider from a persp perspectival point of view, shamans as engaging with ASCs as adjusted styles of communication. That is, shamans have the ability to mediate between humans and other than humans by adopting the communicative level of those other than human persons. <coughs> so they use adjusted styles of communication in order, in order to mediate and renegotiate balance between persons. The way that um, Graham Harvey and I talked about this in our dictionary, was that animism makes shamans both possible and necessary because their roles are about dealing with the problems of living in a relational world. So this takes us away from the, the mind or brain of the individual shaman and into the broader community within which shamans operate. So it takes us out of this neurotheological agenda into one which is a broader perspective, taking account of what it is that shamans do and why they're doing it. So going back to our wounded human figure in Lascaux, um, what I've given you here are two images from the reproduction Lascaux 3, um, which has been touring the world over the last few years. Um, which took the parts of Lascaux which hadn't been reproduced in Lascaux 2, which included the shaft scene. So for the first time, the shaft scene was accurately reproduced. Um, and a, just one interesting feature of that that I had never recognised before, because, of course, photographs in books flatten out what we're looking at. Actually, the rock surface is um, extremely sculptural, and the artists were clearly drawing on the bulge in the rock when uh, portraying the bison there, it's a bit dark, there's not a bit too much light here to see it, but uh, interesting. Anyway, what, what I wanted to say about the Lascaux shaft scene in relation to a perspectival animist approach <coughs> is that the shaman we're looking at here from a neurotheological point of view is a hallucination, um, has the head of a bird like the head of the bird on the bird's top stick. And that is seen as a transformation, a hallucinatory transformation from the human figure into a bird helper of some sort. 
another way of thinking about this from a perspectival point of view is that there is a transformation going on here, but it's one in perspective, from the perspective of a human figure to the perspective of a bird person, in order to reach the communicative level of other persons, and so communicate with them in order to restore balance. There are a couple of other features that I think are interesting um, here. The, the four digits on the human hand are more like the digits on a bird's feet than a human. Um, the human figure uh, has this protrusion in the groin area, typically seen as an erect penis, but curiously it looks much like the feet here. So do we have um, a shaman experiencing somatic hallucinations where their penis is a feet or feet of penises. Um, but I think that perhaps more accurately what we're looking at here are beak-like, bird-like shapes. So that might tell us more about regaining the perspective of birds in this perspectival approach. And that's what I wanted to say. Thank you.